Remember the 90s when taking pictures meant that we had to develop our camera films? Remember the excitement of seeing your pictures one week after they were made? No, us photographers want to see the result instantaneously. Luckily, in 1993, Eric Fossum made the first CMOS sensor at NASA Jet Propulsion Labs. He gave eyes to CMOS technology and so began a photonics revolution. In 2021, CMOS sensors will be in the 4 billion consumer cameras made this year. And when it comes to the industrial and medical sectors, CMOS sensors are the driver of the next revolution. Why? Because ultra high speed and sensitivity, as well as low noise, are essential to monitoring ultra fast processes. Real time quality inspection means near zero waste. Reduced light conditions mean energy savings. Which brings me to hyperspectral imaging, when every pixel of the sensor becomes a spectrometer, and when flexible timing for the shutters and ultra fast frame rates are a constant and requirement. Yet, that is only the tip of the iceberg. The goal of our online meeting on Monday, February 8th, is to understand the next-gen requests from end users working with medical applications, automotive, security, and high-end scientific research. Take the growth of the X-ray market. The challenge is that X-rays are not easy to bend and not easy to focus, meaning that CMOS sensors with very large areas are needed for detection of X-rays. But this is ionizing radiation. The lower the dose, the better for everyone. No wonder sensor sensitivity becomes important. With all this in mind, let's do business. I'm thinking of epic champions like Hamamatsu, Kaleste, Imasenic, First Sensor, IMEC or ST Microelectronics, plus multinationals like Panasonic or Canon. What if they engage with companies driving the industrial, medical, and automotive vision revolution? I'm calling for SIC, Ametec, Striker, Audi, and Valeo. On Monday, February 8th at 3 p.m., we'll be exploring the emerging opportunities for next generation ultra high speed CMOS sensors. See you at the photo finish line. So, see you at the photo finish line. I'm very sorry for the IT problem I had today. I'm going to compensate. I'm going to find at least one business opportunity for each and every one of you. Let's do that over the next two hours. So, also time efficient. Epic, as all of you know by now, Epic is very, very much growing right now. 670 something members, even hard to count. But what you can count on us is that we understand the technology of each and every one of the companies separately. And for that, in Epic, we have 15 employees with a huge passion for traveling. And we're going to start traveling soon, but also for understanding technology. So those 15 people, half of them, we have seven people with a PhD in photonics. Well, for me, mine is quantum physics, but six of them with photonics, and we love the technology and understanding what you do. And also, remember that we also organize fantastic events. We provide access to a network. We help you raise capital, so you're looking for investment, contact us. And we have the biggest website to find a job in photonics, jobsinphotonics.com. Every Epic member has so a long a list, uh, access to a long list of market reports. We have hired all photonics market research, head of photonic market research, Tracy Vanik, who is the person who is going to guide all our members to find market reports in our database. And with this today, we have, we are really in the middle of the season, mid-season finale today, a special focus on CMOS imaging sensors. This season is being fantastic, overwhelmed by the feedback. But please remember the second half of the season starts on Wednesday, with metal 3D printing, Ferrari is going to be in the room, so do not miss that. And next week, we're going to have, from next week, we're going to have super important topics in the industry, like LiDAR 2.1, the roadmap for co-package optics. If you are looking for any technology meeting that in two hours can find you a business opportunity, you have to sign up for this, and please do sign up as soon as possible. And in 2021... I'm a quantum guy. In 2021, we are supporting the quantum industry. I've been pushing a lot for this. It's my dream come true. We start on Wednesday, on, we on Friday. We start on Friday with qubit generation and quantum computing. And then afterwards, we're going to have meetings on the top sectors that quantum technologies are enabling, from defense to medical to transport to communications. So and we we'll finish with bringing all the supply chain together. It's going to be epic. Friday at 3 p.m., we start. But today, 
Today we talk about CMOS sensors and there is no better way of doing it without our collaboration, our collaboration with EMVA, the European Machine Vision Association. Thank you very much for supporting us on this. Also, I would like to thank our partners on the media side, Photonic Views, ASO Optics, and Medical Device. Thank you very much for the constant promotion of all the activities that we do, especially today on CMOS sensors. However, one, two, three. This meeting wouldn't be possible without the support of a spectacular, spectacular sponsor today. We start in Finland, Modulite, a company that specializes in the manufacturing of semiconductor lasers. Laser. They do MB growth all the way to all the technology steps necessary to put even their, their, their lasers into medical equipment or equipment for any application field, the entire supply chain, a success story of Europe. Thank you very much, Modulite. Kaleste, all the way from Belgium. I love Belgium. Belgium is in the south. Netherlands. I hope you have as much snow as we have here. Caleste is a company that specializes in the customization of CMOS sensors. If you're looking for low noise CMOS sensors, so 0.5 noise electron red, these are the kind of people that you need to talk to. The low noise customized sensors of Caleste kind of find a match in this industry. If what you're looking is for very small pixel size, and you're looking for a company that actually can do manufacturing of 300 millimeter wafer, Imacenic in Barcelona. We're going to hear from them, but when it comes to pixel, pixel size reduction, down to 1.4 micrometers, Imacenic is the company to go. But if you're looking for a partner to develop equipment, equipment for the assembly processes from, from lead frame all the way to wafer level packaging solutions. BESI is your ideal partner. But finally, EVG. EVG is our lead supplier when it comes to wafer bonding for 3D stacking. If you're looking for a partner that actually provide all the semicon-oriented process from the, in the semicon market, EVG in the micro optics, they're making a huge push. In the semicon equipment, they're making a huge push, bringing all this industry together. You've got to do great. Thank you very much for Florian and in EVG. Today, we have a fantastic agenda. We're going to hear a lot. We're going to hear from companies like Imacenic, IMS, Theon Sensors, Enverion, Ametec Land, CEA Leti, and CSCM. The whole idea is to find cooperations. So companies in the room, like European Space Agency, like Senof, we're going to find people from Samsung, from Panasonic, making these connections. It's going to be fantastic. And also, I would like to say, at this meeting, at the same time, it's live stream in YouTube. So if you're in YouTube, hello, YouTubers. All you have to do, you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, is send me an email, jose.pozo.epic.com, and I will be more than happy to make that introduction. And during the meeting, please use the chat to post any question, and I will read it in the room. This is also valid for the people in the Zoom room. If you have any question during the meeting, please say so at the chat, and you have a chance to speak and say your question. Use the chat also privately to talk to each other privately during the meeting and do business. That's what we are here for. And also, please make sure that after the meeting, you didn't talk to somebody yet the meeting, send me an email and I will make that introduction. And that is the house rules. Those are the rules of the game. But we are here to do business. And before we start, because today we have a really good, really nice group of friends here, I really want to understand from the company that already mentioned in Belgium that is specialized in the low nice. I want to go to Caleste first. From Caleste, we had Jerome in the room. Jerome, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. I'm very interested about if there is a snow in Belgium, is there? Uh, there is actually a lot of snow in Belgium. Yeah. And most very, important, very I'm interested about, about this market. Caleste has been one of the reference markets, uh, companies in the, in the low noise. I would like to say we have here a, a very interesting group of people to do business. What kind of trends, what kind of applications, what kind of interest, what brought you to this fantastic meeting today? Yes, um, well, I think in general, uh, the mission that we have is to, yeah, and already for many years, to design sensors that go beyond and way beyond what is state of the art. So I think in that sense, we can definitely claim yeah, that we have seen already for a, a long time, in fact, the evolution in the CMOS image sensor industry. Um, in fact, yeah, it all comes down to high-end applications, of course, eh? uh, that we see. And maybe to give an example, I will try to show something on the screen. I hope the IT goes better than mine. Let's see. Yes, much better, yes. of course. All right. So that's already a good start. Um, in fact, if we talk about high-end requirements and can be in different industries, uh, we, uh, scientific imaging can be in space. I see some familiar faces in the meeting here uh, that, that, uh, that are familiar with the space uh, applications. But can also be medical. I mean, anything, in fact, a common trend that we always see is that, yeah, they want, of course, 
better resolutions, higher resolutions, faster, higher frame rates. Um, the noise definitely has to come down such that you get a lot better quality of your image, uh, which is then combined with uh, yeah, long product life cycles. Uh, you want to have high quantum efficiency and so on. So that, let's say that is like a general trend for all those applications. And I think the, like the magic is in the fact that you can actually trade off which requirements are absolutely necessary in your kind of application and make sure that you have yeah, the custom design for you that can really enable your final application. So typically to put it like a short, uh, we, we often tell our customers, yeah, what is your crazy or craziest application idea? And, and don't limit yourself to what is available on the market as, for example, like you mentioned in noise performance, but you have to put that in perspective to the whole application and what is the noise level you need. And can that, for example, be trade off with having a larger pixel size, eh? which can help in that sense. So that's a very traditional question. And yeah, we can eventually solve that by making sure we have the right combination of yeah, the pixel design has to be adapted. We have to make sure, for example, dynamic range and high dynamic range. Uh, how do we combine different gain levels, different noise levels in one uh, final application? Uh, quantum efficiencies uh, and even yeah, sometimes we have to go to very large sensors in order to have a very high sensitivity, a high pixel, a large pixel size. Uh, so with all the challenges that come together with that. So, um, we hear during the meeting a lot about the companies that are in the higher parts of the supply chain, but I can already anticipate, I can already anticipate that there is a huge mm -hmm. push for working in low light conditions. Let's see what IMS says later in the presentation, but I can anticipate that. You're talking a lot about yeah. quantum efficiency. You're talking a lot about low noise. Did you already yeah. see a trend of low light interaction and companies demanding that the light costs a lot of money? We need to work in low light conditions. Well, certainly. Um, now, low light can be something in every kind of wavelength. So low light, you can even consider in low dose when you talk about X-ray. Uh, it's not necessarily light, but okay, you put the scintillators to transform that, but it's essentially a similar question. Uh, another application in astronomy, for sure. Uh, we, we have inherently low uh, light intensity, and typically the difficulty is then when you need to combine low light intensity with still being able also to measure when there is a lot of light in the background. So you have to combine it with a high dynamic range and different sensitivity regions. So I, for, for quite some applications, yeah, we do see that uh, yeah, low light intensity, uh, the, the more sensitive you get in the dark, yeah, the more uh, yeah, things you can start seeing. We have a comment here and we have, we have to be all serious now because we have the large foundry. We have ST Microelectronics. Eric, what's on your mind? Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to uh, to remind everybody because I, I'm afraid it's not well known, and it can be interesting for uh, KLS uh, as well. That uh, ST Micro offers uh, our uh, technology uh, for wafer foundry. So uh, I know that uh, you are uh, mainly a designer, also, but uh, if you are interested, we can uh, go uh, deeper with you and discuss if you are interested by. Uh, some of our yeah. technology capabilities. Huh? Definitely, it's also something we also rely on. Yeah. So indeed, it's a combination of what the foundry can offer in technology yeah. and then all the design techniques that we can apply to it to make it a killer application. That's already a pairing for cooperation, but ST, you're going to be instrumental in this meeting. I'm going to keep coming back to you. But also about this, I think somebody from Barcelona, Ace Optics, we have something on mind. What's on your mind, Mario? Well, I was hearing that uh, in order to improve, uh, to improve sensitivity, sometimes you use um, scintillation detectors. And of course, we have an application like this running, but I wanted to know if what kind, if these detectors can be tailored for some spectral uh, specification. In our application, we need UV sensitivity very high, and so we don't want to go through, and we don't want to go through uh, a scintillator. Sure, indeed. And it's a combination then of uh, probably some backside illumination uh, technique with uh, maybe some coating. Uh, so it's not per default always a scintillation, of course. 
So there are different ways to actually make sure that the right UV range in this case, or the right wavelength has the right, uh, let's say intensity and eventually QE translation in your divider. Uh, but yeah. it's typically something you have to look at, yeah, application per application. But it is good to know that you can support the UV wavelength range. I wanted Indeed, to start yeah. the meeting with a short discussion to get you going because the first speaker today is from one of the most innovative companies that we have in Epic. And they have made a huge difference already in miniaturizing the pixel. I want you to hear from a company that gives me goosebumps. I want you to hear from my friend Renato. Ciao, Renato. Thank you for joining us today. Barcelona is sunny, I know. Here is cold and snowy. Let's have a nice meeting. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to my favorite city in this universe, goes to Barcelona, goes to Imacenic, goes to Renato. The floor is yours. Thanks, Jose. Thanks for the introduction. Actually, you in your introduction with the small pixels and also in the small video, you were you may you showed actually one of my presentation uh, very briefly, which was on large area sensors. So this is somehow summarized a bit uh, my presentation that I'm going to give. The, so let's uh, go to the second speaker today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the floor no, is no. Yeah, let's go. Uh, so I can show you. Let me share the screen now. bottom of the Zoom window. Everybody's logistics are better than mine today. It works perfectly. We see it. Gorilla Glass Clear. Full screen, no? Yes. Okay, so, so as um, was anticipated, so we, so in Masenic, we started uh, in 2017 and we are a fabless semiconductor company specialized in developing custom CMOS image sensors. And uh, we, are in, we are in Barcelona. And uh, yeah, it's one of our goals is to develop new new sensors. So we do innovative products. We, it's an innovation which is recognized also by the highest uh, reference in, the, in Europe, the European Commission. Okay, oops. So what do we do? Uh, so we, when we work with uh, with different uh, customers, so we we want to be innovative and and also at the same time we need to be cost efficient because we know developing a custom image sensor is an important uh, uh, investment for a company so we want this investment to be to produce maximum um, outcome and we work with company from initial concept in the, on the uh, on uh, on the specification just sometimes can be just one idea a simple idea and uh, then we do the same the CMOS design, which is of course the main part of the of the where the innovation goes, or at least the main uh, part where it goes. And uh, for this, we use uh, state of art tools with uh, industry standard uh, tools, which is very it is very important. And we try to do our sensors what what is called in the industry first time right, so that you don't have to go. Uh, different iterations, which can be costly and also uh, in terms of time and, and cost. So for the manufacturing, we use uh, uh, standard foundries uh, abroad, I mean, around the world. So as we said, we are fabless, which is uh, sometimes can be an advantage because it allows to really select uh, the, the best technology for the specific product uh, project. And, uh, and ST Microelectron is, of course, one of, uh, one of the people we're already talking and we work with. And uh, also what is important is for, for image sensors, always it, it's very varied, uh, there are a lot of different specifications so, and um, different applications. And uh, we can work with foundries also to, to get the uh, process updated so that it can be really optimized for your specific application. So if you have a requirement, you have come to us, we talk and we can see even uh, so that the CMOS technology might not be able to give you right now the, the or at least in the standard sense, the, the right performance, but it, come and talk to us because we have a way to work with the founder and get you where you need to be. So once we have the, the sensor, then we, put, we have evaluation kits to, to evaluate the, sam, the sensor and we, we manage the production for uh, for everyone so that you don't have to interface with the foundries. We do this for you and we can do also the, the packaging and the, the camera modules. And we take the sensor from 
really from the specification to volume production. And I will give you some examples in a, in a while. Um, also, just to reiterate, we are very customer focused and uh, all our customers, we have, uh, let's say we started only a few years ago, but we have satisfied customers and very important returning customers and uh, really everywhere in, in the world and all sorts of uh, type of customers from SME, which need to uh, innovate and bring a very new product in the market to large multinational, which uh, also have maybe needed to uh, differentiate or bring new products in the market. So in terms of, oops, that went too fast. In terms of application, um, image sensors are really very ubiquitous. So we, we are starting from uh, medicine, biology and, and science, but then we have quickly started developing sensors for, for other applications. We, for example, space and earth observation, we have experience with uh, uh, radiation hard, hardness, and we know how to do uh, rad, rad hard pixels that can go in, in space and even in, uh, more uh, harsher environments than space. And we can do sensor for industry. Uh, X-ray detection is uh, one of our strong points and we can do very large uh, area sensor. And I will mention uh, an example in a second. And also what is important, uh, just starting from the X-ray is that, and also picking up on the, on the question from the previous uh, uh, attendant is, we can work with beyond the visible. So we, of course we do sensor for visible light detection, but we also go into the infrared or into the UV detection. And an example of sensor we have already developed or we are developing in the bottom part of the slide. So first of all is uh, that was our first product is, is actually a family of sensor, which is designed for intraoral uh, X-ray uh, imaging, dental imaging. And we have a family of sensor from uh, 1.9 megapixels to 9.2 megapixels, all based around the uh, same pixel, which is our design, and it's uh, patented, and it is a high dynamic range uh, pixel. But we can also do high speed, large area, so we are designing a 4 megapixel, 340 frames per second, which is for uh, Earth observation, actually. And as uh, Jose was mentioning, we can do uh, small pixels, uh, we are sampling now a two megapixel with 2.5 micron, uh, which is low noise, low power, and it's a color sensor. And also we are developing for ESA, and I, I hope I am rightly refer referencing the, the, the project. So it is a one megapixel for high performance, visible and infrared for space application. And in development, we have a, a visible IR, electrically switchable sensor, as well as as a wafer scale, uh, five megapixel, five megapixel with five thousand frames per second, and the combined two and three D imager as well. So coming to the almost the last slide, I, I know that uh, Jose always asks this question, uh, and what we can offer. So what we can offer is. Uh, here is like a list of uh, different types of pixels we can do. So global shutter, single photon detection, high quantum efficiency. And uh, I mentioned other things during the, during the talk. So there's really a variety of things. We are really um, an innovative company. And if you need a new image sensor, please come and talk to us because we can probably give you what you need and even better than what you need. And thank you. The last one, just to finish yeah, what we look please. for in this talk, so in this uh, forum. Uh, so what we, we do the design or the sensor, you saw the part, the electronics part, but what we look for is people who are capable of providing optics, micro optics, illumination, sometimes the casing could be also post-processing the sensor technology post-processing. So adding features in the detector and also system integrator. And now I stop. Thank you very much, Renato, very impressive. And uh, let's go immediately for uh, some question. I would like uh, first to invite uh, Francesco from Enea that uh, put a question uh, before about the potential use of quantum dots uh, to enhance uh, UV wavelength. Yes, Please, uh, Francesco. Thank you, thank you, Antonio. Um, yes, I was stimulated by, by some words by the question of Marino Maiorino, or AZ optics. 
because it was asking some. Something yes, that's me. Not a, we don't want to scintillate in your devices. So um, maybe the, the question is uh, to cover the CMOS with another material, for example, sensitive for to UV. UV. Uh, quantum dot could be. So the question is, quantum dot could be potential candidate to make this kind of. Yes, no. So that, that, that because it's possible to pattern them, I don't know what is the, the resolution of your uh, CMOS. In, in spatial resolution, you mean? Yeah. Uh, we can go to down to 1.2 uh, microns. Mm -hmm. How can you get this kind of resolution? Well, that's, um, I mean, there's a rule of thumb of the, of the which is known since uh, some time. So in CMOS, you can do a pixel, which is uh, between 10 and 20. The smallest pixel you can do is about 10 times bigger than the minimum feature size of the technology. And you have nowadays technologies on, uh, I don't know, we do image sensor 65 nanometers. So you see, you can do about the micron uh, size pixel. It, it's linked to the, to the technology which is used for making uh, the sensor. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the same question to you. Actually, quantum dot, yeah, it's an interesting te technology. I mean, one has to always to consider when adding things, it can be either post-processing. So what I had in my one of the last slides. So that's if so, there is someone that can provide this and then we can add it as a post-processing or otherwise we can see with the founder if this can be introduced in the, in the, in the fabrication cycle of the, of the CMOS. Bear in mind that CMOS is a very well, very well structured and uh, has a high um, a quality control. So that has to fit really in the, in the spec of the foundry, but this is something we, we know what they require. And if you come with the right technology, we can, we can do the interface and try to integrate uh, quantum dots or other technology within the, the process and really get a better sensor. Mm -hmm. Okay, Francesco, I, I love quantum dots. I was, I was, I got, I got to wait. So we have in Epic, we have Q, Q yeah, &A just, technology. Just, just we have Houston dot in Belgium. We have companies who are developing quantum dots, colloidal dots uh, for, for almost any application. Uh, when you, when you ask about quantum dots, Francesco, is there any activity in Enea uh, in Italy that you are purchasing, uh, chasing this, this technology? Yeah, now um, I'm, I'm leading a project on this, on, on quantum dot or laser patterning. So that's my, that's my, in my question, because uh, here I see that uh, there are two points, the sensitivity to light, for example, different uh, wavelength, and also the uh, patterning is important. So we are dealing with something that mm, use, can be used, mm, can be deal with light like quantum dot, and in the meantime, we can make a patterning of them. So, uh, so that, that's the idea. Uh, we can pattern the quantum dot over the CMOS. Uh, we have a kind of technology with laser technology which we can pattern over the CMOS. So fantastic you know what I'm gonna do Francesco? sorry what I'm gonna do is that the companies in the in the quantum dots in Epic, especially these two that I'm saying QA technology and Custom Dot, I'm gonna put them in touch with you because I want them to talk to you in private about laser patterning and bringing them closer to this community. I'm planning the topics for the next quarter now. Okay. We're going to have a meeting on quantum dots and you will okay. see, this is going to be okay. fantastic. Okay. I, want to back, I want to go back to Renato. Renato, at some point uh, during the presentation, you mentioned the space uh, and the space technologies has been, I live in North Vike, space technologies have been one of my passions, but uh, somebody else has, has even a bigger passion than me. Kiriaki from ESA, from ESA, the European Space Agency, thank you very much for joining today. I brought in front of you some of the best CMOS manufacturers for you to do something with them. What brought you to this meeting and what kind of cooperations can we start after this? Well, uh, the fact that we already have cooperation with uh, both the people that they have already discussed, I think it already explains why I'm here in the meeting because I'm quite interested in this technology. We do, we want to have sensors for space. We want to have to replace, or at least to fill the gap wherever it is of CCDs. That's why we are here for the CMOS discussion. The CCDs are still here, but the CMOS, they offer a lot of other things that CCDs cannot. Uh, space is a very challenging, of course, uh, customer and environment. So we have the radiation to fight. We have uh, 
we are not so challenging in terms of size of the pixels, for example. Uh, but uh, those are the technology. Right? Validation, making them robust, making them Absolutely. reliable. Is there, yeah, yeah. The supply chain is ready for companies like Caleste, companies like Imaseni, you heard already, you're collaborating with them. Uh, is, the, is, the, is the supply chain ready to actually take those tests and make the entire validation for the two entry space programs? Is there uh, anything that we can help? Well, the short answer is yes. The long answer is the European supply chain, which is a different story because uh, as you see, both Kaleste and Imasenic, and we have contracts with both of them and very nice collaborations with very good results. Uh, they are fabulous. So we need to also have the foundry to make the detectors. And to do that in Europe, there are not many. We have a steel, of course, now around the table. We have a foundry, we have a Tower Jazz, uh, a European borderline. So to have the full supply chain is, is a long story. So I don't think we can reply immediately, but for sure uh, we can fly CMOS. We fly CMOS on space. Yeah. So yes, absolutely. I, I want always to, to keep bringing you in touch with innovative companies. Uh, also Ian McKenzie, who's watching. Thank you very much for all the work that you are doing, uh, following up on all the introductions that we make. Back to Renato. Renato, I love this slide. It's, it's poetry in epic words. Uh, we could go through all the bullet points, but uh, let's start with the beginning and finish with the first one because we have a long program. You mentioned micro optics. And when you mention micro optics, I go to Martin, <laughs> EBG, Florian Anin, and, you, and I tell him, these guys are look, uh, doing, doing CMOS sensors on 200, 300 millimeter wave, uh, wafers, uh, and they're looking for micro optics. What kind of cooperation do you see happening after this? May I briefly share my screen? Of course, this is your meeting. Can you see the screen? Gorilla glass clear because Corning is here, by the way. <laughs> Perfect. So basically, yeah, it summarized what we could do for the image sensor world. So basically, we are active in two key areas. One is the micro optics. Um, stacking of lenses, but also in some cases, diffractive optics, micro lens arrays directly on the image sensors, uh, endoscopes can be done like this, uh, uh, but uh, also many other uh, applications. Uh, definitely uh, it's a key area for very small sensors, the wave level optics, we can do it up to 300 millimeter, or we can even add, add nanostructures directly on the pixels, uh, we have done here one very nice example with this a small company called Nano Lambda, where we put directly uh, uh, filters on top, nano imprinted filters, so no, not absorption filters, it's photonic filters on every pixel, uh, a different color that's then integrated and uh, you can nicely have here on a single image sensor is a, a spectral imager but we could also do here polarizer optics or whatever uh, is wanted. And of course we do the whole world of wafer bonding. So we, if you want to add to a CMOS image sensor for, uh, like for the X-ray cadmium telluride on top, uh, why not? But we could also go to the IR range and put some three fives on top and improve the sensors in that case. Donato, is that useful? Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that I would like to admire from EVG, the work that you're doing for many EPIC members, including Wave Optics, and um, being able to, to really push the innovation of European companies, I really admire you for that. Renato, you should know that it's not only about the equipment, there are ways to collaborate also in the, in the process and also ways to collaborate in the services, right, Martin? Absolutely. So basically, this is one, uh, we have our competence center, and it's really we want to leverage these technologies, what we have uh, to as many companies as possible to enable new ideas. So it's not just about the, the, the big foundries and getting equipment there. We really want to uh, improve here the technology. That's what drives us at EVG, and uh, we are always happy to find uh, great new ideas which we can help forward. Renato, thank you. No, Renato, we have two quick questions for you uh, in the chat. One for you, one for, for EVG. The first one for you. Frederick from CSCM, what question do you have for Renato? Yes, so basically it's on uh, um, the continuation to what was just said. So uh, for the micro optics, do you mean to, for instance, micro lenses to increase the light collection efficiency? And if so, uh, which wafer size uh, are in use at Imasenic? Thanks. Yeah. yeah, so normally, yes, it's for, uh, we need micro lenses. So let's say, you know, the foundries can provide micro lenses, but uh, often they are limited 
equine performance and also to the size. So it can be for maybe for large pixels, we need different micro lenses and as well to improve the, the efficiency. In terms of wafer size, we use 200 and 300 millimeter. We have another question, and this one is from Jerun from Caleste in Belgium, all the way to EVG in Florian and in Austria. Uh, yeah, you showed an interesting slide on this, uh, yeah, this, this uh, nano print of the, of the filters. So, so do, yeah, down to which pixel size and also up to which pixel size, because also the larger sizes we're typically interested in. And what kind of shapes can you do? Because I, sometimes we use these micro lenses to like focus eventually the photons in a, even an offset position on the pixel. So, so how, how flexible is that technique? So it's very flexible. Uh, so larger pixels are actually easier for us. The, the, the challenge is definitely the overlay alignment. Here, uh, it depends what requirement you have and uh, what structures you have. So lenses, we can align more precisely than nanostructures. Uh, however, uh, pixel sizes uh, in the uh, middle uh, micron range, so the, the very tight uh, pixels, so like two micron and, and less, that, that might be a challenge today, but we're working on that. Uh, for lenses, this is easier applicable. And uh, yeah, for the nanostructures, uh, we would have to check what you want. But for the size, for the bigger size, you, you can have it as big as you want, uh, I would say. So we have done uh, anything uh, full wafers, uh, even in panel size. What a really great way of starting the meeting already. Many, many applications and potential partners is found, but we continue and we continue because we go to the Netherlands to one of the equipment suppliers that have made a difference in Epic in the last six months. Looking to assemblies in the automotive, in the medical, when we said that we we're going to have a meeting on CMOS sensors, where the first one that contacted us said we need to be there because we really can be an end user for many of the CMOS manufacturers. Let's talk to them. Wouter. Wouter is the R&D manager of IMS, the floor and the attention of everyone goes to the Netherlands. Goedemiddag, Wouter. Goedemiddag. Good afternoon, all. I'm going to share my screen with you because I have hopefully a very nice... Bottom of the Zoom window. Yes, everybody knows about me today. And then, fantastic. Yes, all right. Uh, so, good afternoon. I am Wouter Sporenok, R&D Project Manager at the uh, IMS, and I would like to talk to you about the innovation of optics assembly by decoupling alignment and fixation. So, IMS designs, builds, and supplies assembly production equipment, typically with a very high accuracy, within a range from 50 micrometers up to uh, 100 nanometers for low volume and high volume. When we low volume, we talk about 100 units assembled a year for high volume. We talk uh, about a heartbeat of a machine of two seconds. Every two seconds, a new camera is popping out. Uh, we are based in the Netherlands, Almelo, privately owned, and we have a staff of 120. We have three markets, which is medical, smart devices, and automotive. Over here, we have some uh, customer products and customers. Uh, we assemble sensors, micro optics, and actuators for a lot of parties, as you can see below here. For now, I would like to focus on micro optics. So at IMS, we developed the optics alignment workstation. It is an active alignment workstation for lens to chip up to six degrees of freedom with an alignment accuracy of 100 plus minus 100 nanometers and it is modular. So easy integration uh, allows scaling up from low to high volume. And on the right, you see the, a picture of the modular workstation. Um, here we have the lens and here we have the PCB and up here are the targets. Each target shows a in this case, an MTF curve. And when all these curves uh, nicely overlap, we have the right position for this lens. And then the lens should be fixated on the chip. Typical customer requirements we uh, receive is that they would like to have it in a very short cycle time. So 363 cameras in an hour. And we all know that depends on hardware. So <clears throat> camera frame rate, 
the power up time of the of the of the chip and also on the part-to-part -part variation for the optics and it also should include two seconds of uv cure which they call fast cure and now i'm going to make a bold statement um, fixation is the necessary evil and why am i saying this because curing is causing idle time for the active alignment workstation so the curing takes up two to 15 se seconds and the uh, expensive equipment is doing nothing in that time. Uh, there's also glue shrinkage, which introduces inaccuracy of the uh, alignment. So there's a typical glue bead of 200 micrometers causes an inaccuracy of one micrometer. So on the upper right over here, I made a small tolerance chain for the inaccuracy versus the process steps. So machine builders work a lot on the alignment and we got it down to 0.1 micrometer. And then there is the pre-cure, which has one micrometer inaccuracy. And then there's also the final cure, which also adds up one or even more micrometers. So to my opinion, it is worth trying to eliminate or replace the pre-curing because that is a large part, a large chunk of the tolerance chain. We have an option at IMS, and that is what we call the position freezing carrier. It is a decoupling of the alignment and fixation. So over here, we have the position freezing carrier. Once again, this is the lens, and here we have the chip, and there is the position freezing carrier in the middle. middle. It's also, yeah, you can also say there's a fork around the lens, and that is actually holding the uh, the fork is holding the lens above the chip. And via this animation, I'm going to show how it works. So here we have a carrier and uh, a pick and place action which moves the lens on top of the, uh, the, send, the, the CMOS. Here we have the hexapod, which grabs the fork and aligns the lens stack on top of the CMOS. When the position is there, the carrier freezes the position. And if you freeze the position, you can take this into a parallel process, which happens here. And then on the left side here, you're already working on the next alignment. And so we decoupled uh, alignment and fixation. And this uh, system we have over here has an uh, accuracy of 700 nanometers in zoom direction so it's even better than the tolerance in the pre-cure uh, what you have over there uh, it provides a alternative fixation uh, alternative fixation opportunities and you have a higher efficacy of your equipment so this i already told so now the epic motto what can IMS do for you? Well, we offer high accuracy active alignment. We help you reduce production cycle time and we offer means to consider alternative fixation methods. What can you do for IMS? Well, you can present your uh, production challenge to us and uh, or provide samples for pre-automation stu studies. And we will be happy to work with you on this. So please get in touch. Thanks. So, so I think we have Antonio muted. The sentence of Epic 2020 is, uh, is uh, muted. You are muted. But for me, the first question is obvious. Uh, so this we are talking about micrometer accuracy. Nice. And you're using active alignment, which was surprising. So why are you using active alignment and what are the advantages here? Why are we using active alignment? Well, uh, for sure to find the best position of the lens above the CMOS. Uh, this cannot be done, uh, not be done uh, passively anymore. And active alignment is, I would say, uh, state of the art, but also uh, mature in, um, in industry standards already. And we're taking the next step and decoupling the alignment and fixation so that expensive equipment, which is needed for active alignment, can be placed in a parallel process 
So we do not care about uh, how long fixation takes or even if, uh, fixation um, maybe can be done with another technology other than glue. I, I fully agree with you. I mean, part, a very small part of the assembly is the assembly of the sensor, the assembly of the other components, what is what's important. And what we are going now is to customization, as we heard from the first two speakers. And I think there is where you make a huge difference. I want to give the floor. I want to ask something to a friend of mine here in the room, uh, Carl from Eclipse Optics. And the reason why I want to go into you, uh, Carl, is because Eclipse Optics is one of these companies, the sign houses, that is making a big difference in this industry by providing people with the sign forces. And when it comes to the CMOS industry, you now you have a chance to maybe find a way to cooperate with one of machine makers. So Carl, what, what brought you to this meeting? The sentence, uh, Antonio, the sentence of today is you are muted. And also, okay. yes. Okay, yes, uh, we are uh, 20 people in, in Stockholm uh, and in Lund and Malmö, south of Sweden. And we are, uh, we have a background in optical design, many of us, or laser, or um, me and another has a background in image sensors. I have a background in infrared image sensors. And uh, we provide uh, customers with solutions for optical design and uh, lighting design and uh, camera technology. Uh, we have uh, customers in automotive and eye tracking uh, fields. So we think this is very uh, exciting. Uh, I've heard about the micro optics. It's, it's something which our customers in eye tracking has been interested in uh, for, to come really close to the, to the eye. Um, so uh, yeah, basically uh, we have a lot of uh, knowledge to offer, not only in Sweden, but also in, in Europe uh, for customers. Um, one of our, uh, our exciting projects right now is the Polaroid instant cameras. Uh, we de designed the optics for them. It's uh, like a uh, restart of, of the instant cameras uh, we, we, in a dig digital form. So we, we, like, we, we print, uh, uh, we print uh, the, the photos. It's, not a, it's a digital process. So uh, we have a, yeah. We do both small and large products. Thank you very much, Carl. Yeah. And please continue the success. So if any company is looking for any kind of design system level of the any optical instrument, they should go to them. Bauter, uh, one thing that is for me very important when it comes to helping the companies in the, in the, in the automation of their center is to really fully understand what kind of applications are, are they targeting and make the whole system for those applications. You have made a big difference in the automotive sector with many of your customers. Uh, when it comes to CMOS for the automotive industry, what kind of advices do you give to the companies in the room that want to put their products into the automotive market? Well, start already discussing with the manufacturing on, in, at the product level um, for uh, we, the, 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 actually the machine builder can already uh, think along with your, your your product design and if you have uh, already a product and just manufacture it then maybe you do not get the the, the most suited uh, machinery to actually actually build it um, so get in touch with the manufacturer or the, or of your uh, for your equipment as fast as as possible i would say we talk a lot already about optics. We talk a lot about our packaging. You know what? Let's go to the sensor side. Let's talk more about CIS. Let's talk more about s -Queer. Let's talk more about night vision. I can't wait for the next presentation because I'm a big fan of this. We go to Theon sensors. These guys make fantastic night vision systems. We, wh whoever wants to play Call of Duty with me, I got aficionado based on the organization of this meeting. Please call me separately. But Dimitris, thank you very much for being with us today. Talk to us about Theon sensor. This is Cool, the floor is yours. Hello, Jose, and everybody else. Uh, I am Dimitrios Mandridis from Athens, Greece. Uh, let me go directly to the presentation. This is a defense uh, application, so you have to bear with us. We can tell everything that we are doing. Let me see. Share and maximize. Can you see everything? Looks fantastic. 
You know, right? Uh, I'm the head of optical engineering here at Theon Sensors. I design lenses, instruments, and kind of a part of the system uh, for Theon, for the Theon R&D team. We are a company that uh, goes directly all the way from R&D to the market. We design, we produce, we assemble, we test, and of course we market our products and our products are basically in two categories, image intensified night vision or night vision in general, as I will show you later, and long wave IR and cool the micro bolometer based systems such as weapon sites. We were established uh, 23 years ago. We are mostly export oriented because we are in Greece, a small country. We cannot afford to not be export oriented, obviously. We're 140, 150 people uh, here working. We have uh, maybe 400 millions of euros export in the past years. And we have delivered 100,000 systems total to the customer. This is not a small number compared to the big players uh, for Europe, like uh, Safran or uh, Thales or anybody else. We have exports uh, in uh, 55 countries. We follow, of course, ISO, and we are headquartered in Athens, where all the R&D and most of the marketing happens and the production. But we have uh, subsidiaries and or collaborators around the globe, as you see, such as in Switzerland, uh, Germany, Indonesia, Singapore, India, and the United States. Uh, I'm going to show you two of the customers that we are mostly proud of, the German Special Forces, the KSK, if you know them, and the U.S. Marine Corps uh, selected our goggle to be their basic uh, goggle that you see here on the top left uh, for the majority of their uh, operators. So we are uh, fairly successful, I would say. This is what uh, we do. This is what we make our product range. Uh, there are two categories, as I said, night vision on the left. Uh, we make my, uh, monoculars, binoculars, and modular uh, binoculars. We make weapon sites that go uh, on top of the weapon as clip-on or as a standalone version. And we have uh, cameras for vehicles. Uh, we have a collaboration with BAE Huglungs up in um, Sweden. We make also night vision driver periscopes. And our thermal uh, imaging line, again, has a standalone periscope for vehicles as an upgrade but we also make those weapon, thermal weapon sites that we are very, very proud of and a new generation is coming up. We also do a lot of custom works where we, uh, custom work, where we uh, make a lot of our bread and butter, uh, customizing projects and uh, products for specific solutions for specific applications. And uh, those products that you see here are digital and in need of um, specialized uh, sensors such as long wave IR sensors, or uh, low light CMOS sensors. Uh, let me show you a little bit of uh, the past for night vision, the present and the future, so you, you can understand of what we are looking for uh, from uh, EPIC or uh, collaborators in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, until yesterday, uh, people were using those nice and cute uh, night vision goggles, but they are uh, analog. They have no input and no output. They cannot be used in daytime because the image intensifier tubes get burned in daytime. Uh, they are bulky, uh, they have relatively narrow field of view, but since they are analog, they can operate with one single AA battery for 24 hours. That's amazing, excellent uh, power consumption. Today, people combine a night vision goggle with an ERI display uh, and make the instrument digital now, where you can uh, project uh, augmented reality information, where your friend, uh, friends are, where your enemies are, uh, compasses, uh, and a lot of information coming into the modern soldier. Uh, but this is somewhat power hungry, and there's an always a brightness struggle, meaning that there's not enough uh, brightness coming out of the display to be projected to your eye for daytime use. For nighttime use, we are okay so far. And this is what you get. You get uh, augmented information through your goggle or actually overlaid behind your goggle. And if you remove the goggle, ideally you would like to use this during the daytime. And this is where technology is going. Uh, this is a prototype from Microsoft's uh, offering to the US Army. Uh, it's a future soldier helmet, uh, as you see. It has unlimited input and output. It has augmented reality, it is digital. It has augmented reality for gesture control and everything. And of course, it uses the best of the best of ultra light, low, ultra low light CMOS sensors to image even in the darkest nights. 
Okay, uh, but for this to happen, you have to solve the brightness issue to be able to operate this in daytime use. And of course you have to reduce the, the, the power consumption because then the soldier becomes a system and there's a lot of power being consumed by the soldier and the soldier has to carry a lot of batteries for him to really operate. So in brief, what we are looking for today and what we are in need for today is near eye projection optics, as you see here, a field of use of 40 degrees or more. They have to be military spec, meaning that they have to operate at minus 20 degrees Celsius or less. It's not a commercial product anymore. They have to be high brightness uh, so they can operate during daytime and there should be low light leakage because there's a lot of uh, technology there, a lot of solutions that they emit light and that is catastrophic for night vision um, uh, environments. Uh, we are also looking to integrate this into a battle management system or a soldier management system to share power uh, and to have compatibility for input and output with uh, larger platform, soldier platforms. And of course, Theron is going to augment uh, the input to the, to the goggle or to this uh, overlay. And uh, pretty much that's it. I want to be brief and not give away anything. And please shoot me with uh, questions. I see here. That's Thank you it. very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Dimitri. This was really an amazing uh, presentation. And I think that we can speak for hours with you because at EPIC, we are engaged with the sensor. We are strongly engaged with micro optics, uh, with augmented reality. So uh, mm -hmm. really, who wants to be the first one shooting the, the question to Dimitri, please? I think somebody raised their hand, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see. And I just okay. looking. We have I Imasenic, yeah. Renato, what's Imasenic, on your mind? Yes, and then also Alessandro. Yeah, I was curious to know, you, you use a CMOS sensor, is it uh, you buy off the shelf or you do you command your custom development? We do buy off the shelf. Uh, we've uh, actually did a big uh, review of available uh, low light uh, sensors. And there's a misunderstanding about low light sensors. Everybody, many companies says, oh, we do a low light sensor. But in reality, most of them are uh, what I would call a sunset or a dawn sensors and not many sensors go into the actual night. There is uh, this um, nomenclature about uh, classifying night vision as uh, you know, level three, level four, level five. We really need to go to level four at least and ideally to level five, which is uh, uh, 0.2 millilux uh, of luminance. Uh, we do buy off the shelf to answer your question. We've never actually developed a sensor for specifically for our needs. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. And also I see another question from uh, uh, Upsensing, Alessandro, please. Yeah, okay, Alessandro Upsensing, thanks for the presentation, it was uh, really interesting. So I wonder if you see any need there for logarithmic pixels achieving extreme low light performance and low power and uh, wide dynamic range of response. Uh, what did you say? If we can have large pixels, you mean? If you will use logarithmic, log logarithmic pixels, if you see a future there for log pixels uh, in order to achieve your requirements, because these are very challenging requirements, so you need low power. You mean uh, you need, log uh, logarithmic, low logarithmic pixels? No. Logarithmic pixels. Yeah, for you sure, we do. Pixels. Yeah, we, we do use uh, a sensor with a logarithmic uh, response from a French company. And uh, we were pretty happy with it as long as we used it. And uh, definitely those um, um, applications that I showed you in the end where the sensor has to operate both in the daytime and in the deep night time, my opinion is that they have to be logarithmic. And mind you, the worst case scenario that you are in nighttime having to image a very dark scene and having you know a car uh, coming your way or the street lights that are really, really bright relatively to the dark uh, surroundings. And uh, for sure, dynamic range uh, has to be at least uh, seven orders of magnitude and uh, ideally 10 or more. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm curious also to learn uh, something more about your requirements, for example, for uh, 
the uh, augmented uh, glass, augmented uh, Googles. Because here we have an uh, expert from CSM and uh, other company working on augmented uh, reality. Uh, yeah, like I said, uh, we're looking for uh, something very thin, like a waveguide maybe, uh, or a micro lens uh, projecting unit uh, that has a, around 40 degrees of field of view from you know, 37 to 42 or whatever, uh, and to have enough brightness to project during the nighttime for sure, but ideally during the daytime as well. But the problem is the brightness, but also the military specification of this thing. You cannot offer me a solution that works only in a room up to five degrees Celsius. That is not good for you know, field, uh, field usage by a defense company. So this is where the, the edge of technology is nowadays. I think there are only one or two or three companies uh, in the globe that can offer um, negative temperature uh, operation. But I'm open for suggestions. <laughs> Yeah, great. This is important. I think that uh, the temperature uh, is a very important uh, yeah. challenge for all these devices and also for batteries consumption and, and so on. That's right. Anybody else would like to comment or suggest a proposal? Well, Dimitris used the magic word. He used the word waveguide. So when people say waveguide, you have to look at EVG. Martin, what are we going to do here? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I can immediately solve because it's also a question a lot to the optical designers of the WaveGuides. However, uh, what uh, we could do is to check uh, what material requirements you have and how you could imprint or transfer uh, into glasses that are more stable to the negative uh, temperatures. And this is definitely something that's doable and we're working on that. So uh, I think the WaveGuide, uh, if you have a design, is a, a solvable uh, issue. Thank well, you we don't very design much. ourselves. Oh, sorry. We don't design ourselves uh, the projecting units. Uh, we mm. are looking into integrating uh, mm. design units. We don't have the capacity to design ourselves the optics and the display mm. and the projecting optics. We are looking into uh, you know getting the unit uh, as a module. Got it. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you so much, Dimitris, because we have the designers here, we have every component that you need here, and you made the better the meeting better for your presence, and I loved it, every single minute of it. When you said shoot me with your questions, I just want you to have you, I want to have you more often here. Thank you very mm -hmm. much from the bottom of my thank heart. You. We're going to continue with the program because everybody who knows me knows how much I love graphing, <laughs> and we go to one of the companies who is making a success out of being an Epic member because of all the collaboration that we are starting Thing because Everion is a member of Epic. Poco all the way from beautiful Finland with a beautiful background. Really looks fantastic. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Emberion. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. The background is from Switzerland, not from Finland. So <laughs> hope I'm not misleading with that. But let's switch to my slides. Hold on. Well, the background outside this fly, this roll-ups looks very similar now in the Netherlands, but without the mountains. So how it's almost is... here. Yes, let's go to presentation mode, full screen. Yes, I'm not so experienced with this. I think... So here and then mm. whole screen. So how is this for you now? Fantastic. Great. Excellent. So let's go forward. So here is my name, Volker Lanz. I'm a product manager for our visible to short wave infrared technologies. And I will quickly introduce our company, tell about our technology and our products. And then in the last slides, I present that what kind of collaborations we are looking from other EPIC members. So let's go forward. So we are rather young company. We were established in 2016. We are spin out from Nokia Technologies. And we are based in two locations, in Cambridge, UK, and in Espo, Finland. In Cambridge, we have nanomaterials and sensor development. And in Espo, Finland, we are working on electronics and system development, also testing and calibration. And we have a team which size is approaching 30 already. And we have a unique combination of skills that we've been working on novel nanomaterials for some time already, and then also designing IC CMOS and integrating, integrating those two things together. And also we are experienced in product creation and applied research 
and we have um, different backgrounds in our teams. Kind of people have been working in a, a sim, a small and medium-sized enterprises, and also in larger corporate corporation environments. And we are well networked both in the research community and also in Europe. And we have business relationship established with CMOS manufacturing foundries. So what makes our products unique? I think it's a combination of ma many things, but it's mostly this kind of novel nanomaterials and those combined with the uh, state of our, our CMOS technology that we are capable of designing those in-house and then monolithically integrating them together. The role of the nanomaterials, nanocrystallines are photoabsorption with those we will get a broad spectral wavelength range coverage. We can capture light from visible to short wave infrared, also mid wave and long wave. And also we are utilizing graphene in our image sensors. And with that, we have actually two benefits. We can simplify the design of the device structure and make the uh, steps of the production more, more simple and cost efficient. And they also bring a performance benefit in them noise performance and also enabling stable operation in higher temperatures. And also we are designing the readout electronics, the CMOS IC underneath the light absorbing pixels. That's our own, own design. And we have also patented our technology that our products are based on. And we are aiming at different markets and different application areas. Machine vision is the one that we are now focusing in the beginning, but there are many others that these sensors are well suited for. So quickly about the products. These are coming to the market soon. So we've been working on the sensor development, uh, VGA sensor. 640 times 512 pixels in our array and the pixel size is 20 times 20 micrometers so the image sensor form factor is one inch or 6.4 millimeters and each pixel covers the spectral range from 400 up to 2000 nanometers and these the pixels or the sensors they exhibit a very nice large dynamic range and good, excellent noise performance. And it's based on colloidal quantum dots and also graphene photodiodes. And they are monolithically integrated on the CMOS readout IC. And on parallel on the sensor development, we have developed also a complete camera system. It's a VCA camera that is intended, say, for night vision applications or vision applications in challenging conditions say weather conditions and also various machine vision applications like food quality, waste sorting, to mention a few examples. And the camera is monochromatic and it's based on our own sensor. And we offer it also with an optional housing that is compatible with off-cell lenses. And the first sample products will be available spring this year, around March time. And here's a bigger picture of the camera. You can see that it's quite sizable. We have in the beginning optimized the performance of the imaging performance of the camera, which means that we want to efficiently cool the sensor. And therefore the sizing of the housing is designed so that it has enough mass to act as a heat sink and kind of ensure that everything is properly cooled down. And this is the kind of, first used with a proprietary PC software tool, what we offer, and then soon it will be updated. The firmware will be updated that it can be used with customer's own software tool based on a camera link control and data interface. And the commercial products, those will be available this year in summertime around August. And here are some future directions that this is the first product which is coming out, which I just described, but we are also working on future products. And here are some kind of lines of development that we are working on. The first VGA sensor will offer frame rates up to 100 frames per second for a certain sighted performance, but we are also working on how to increase the size of the pixel array and also how to increase the speed of the 
the, the frame rate of the camera and also working on the power consumption optimization. And then on a longer term, we are also looking into new packaging solutions that we can miniaturize the size of the packaging and also kind of look for low cost packaging solutions and also such a solutions that optimize our process flow. And then on a longer timeline, we are also looking into ways that how we can combine different multispectral detectors in the same array, combining visible short wave infrared and also mid wave infrared in a one imaging sensor. And all would benefit of the use of graphene in a way or another. So these are the future directions for us. And then what we are looking for, what kind of collaboration partners. So these are kind of, how would I say the order? They are equally important. We are looking for visual camera optics, optics that would cover the whole spectral range, that we have a uniquely wide spectral response range. It's extending up to 2000 nanometers and even beyond in the future. So looking for lens solutions for this range. And like I said, kind of looking for image sensor packaging uh, solutions and partners. And then also in the application domain, we are looking for partners and joint RT projects in the hyperspectrum domain. And then also we are very keen on trying out our uh, product offering in, in the field and with the customers. So pilot and field studies would be very interesting for us. And then of course, we are looking for customers who would be interested in first testing the product samples and then eventually acquiring one of our cameras in the use. And then for future discussions, I invite you to contact me directly, or you can also co contact our sales and marketing director, Juri Hämäläinen, and for more in-depth technical discussions, Tapani Ryhänen, our CTO, is the best contact. I would like to say hello to both Jiri and Tapani and Foco. You really are doing an amazing job, an amazing job. You're going with the success stories of industrialization nanotechnology that we have in Europe. Anything that you can do to help Emberion will be also a little bit helping, helping me. Thank you very much. You will look for many, many potential partners. Let's go to one of them. Let's go to ST Microelectronics. Eric, what's on your mind? Um, yes, uh, thanks for the very interesting presentation. So uh, I understand that uh, you are using uh, two innovative, uh, let's say, material. One is uh, quantum dot and the other is graphene. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, one of the reasons of uh, using graphene is to uh, uh, improve the noise performances and to allow for uh, higher mm -hmm. temperature be, uh, functionality. Mm -hmm. So I wonder why you are still uh, say, uh, obliged to, to cool down the, the camera. Well, with the graphene and with the colloidal quantum dots, we don't get rid of all the temperature dependencies in, in the system. So I'm not a material physicist, so my answers are perhaps a bit naive, but the graphene will kind of change the way how the different material layers interact with each other. So it's kind of solving some problems, but not all the temperature dependency problems. So I think you, you guessed my next question. Mm -hmm. so what can improve it and so that you can get rid of uh, the cooling? Because it's an important, uh, let's say, uh, factor for the adoption of this technology, I'm afraid. There are many ways. One is computational that we can also measure the temperature of the chip. And then we do have models and algorithms how to comp compensate the temperature the differences. So that, that, that's one way. And, and cooled operation really is something that we need to push into that. And Foco, you, we have discussed this in another meeting, actually. Uh, uh, Eric, if there is something that you can help on this, that would be really, truly fantastic. But I want to introduce you to more potential partners, Foco. Uh, I want to go to a system integrator in the US because mm -hmm. I do believe that these guys can test your cameras. We're going to go to Lighthouse Imaging. And we have here with us, representing Lighthouse Imaging, Benjamin. Benjamin, as a system integrator, you just saw the presentation from Emberion. 
What can we do together? I pay for the shipping expenses of the detectors all the way to the US. Yes, very good. Well, uh, very, very good to speak with everybody. Good afternoon, good morning. Um, we, Lighthouse Imaging, we develop uh, custom medical imaging systems, typically endoscopic, uh, minimally invasive systems. So we have a variety of different needs. Sometimes we're looking for very small image sensors so that we can keep incisions very tiny. Other times we're looking for multispectral, hyperspectral imaging. It's, it's really a broad field uh, of requirements. Um, I am interested, um, this, this goes uh, for Imbirion, but also some of the other uh, image sensor companies. What can, what can be done to help minimize package size while still maintaining you know, large and, and quality pixels? Is that something that, that is a, a focus for you or is that perhaps um, not, in, not something that you're, you're um, uh, focused on at this point in time? You, you, you address some of the elephants in the room. They are, they are Renato, Jerome, they have a lot to commit from Imacenic and from Caleste and IMS. But the, the question was to you, Foco, how can we help keeping, keeping the, the, the sensor characteristics reducing the aspect ratio of the whole thing? Well, there were so many questions. <laughs> In, in kind of, or it was kind of a big question. I don't even know where to start to answering. First, I would like to understand better the application that you said that endoscopy is one of them. You, know, applications. you want to, to reduce the, 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 the aspect ratio. I have to go to a company that actually has made a difference in compact sensors. Oh, compact you, you mean that the sensor to make yes. that term. I, I, I would say that cooling is one thing that where I would start that getting rid of the TEC that that's one, one way and a very efficient way to make it smaller and then making the pixel size smaller, kind of keeping the array size, but making the pixel bits smaller. I would say that's something that we can do because we have the in-house team for the IC design. So we can design the ROIC, which supports smaller pixel size. That's quite straightforward. It's of course a big effort to do an easy, I see design ground, but it, it's perfectly doable. And then the other thing is to work on the uh, cooling to reduce the need for the cooling and use the, for example, this computational methods that I mentioned that. Benjamin, you're looking for That's partners great. on the system integration. Many people are going to want to contact you offline. <laughs> thank you very much for being yes, with thank us. You. But uh, I want to go because to have more questions for Emberium. I want to go to AV Sensing. Alessandro, what's on your mind? Hello, uh, thanks for... Uh, Drive the... safely. I hope you are, we are not putting in danger here. Okay. Yeah, so don't worry, don't worry. I, I, I'm safe. So, yeah, so basically uh, it was nice presentation from uh, Emberion. I think it was a nice development to see all this. At Emisensi, we recently started the, the, the service company, and we basically help company to bridge the gap between their custom needs to, to get to the image sensor market and the market. So what we do is, uh, okay, it requires quite a lot of effort to choose and between who, who, are, who is the ideal partner to get to the market, what, is, what kind of technology, what are the foundry possibilities, and we help companies to, to get there. So to uh, choose between different technologies is what is available, how to get into a real uh, development or uh, evaluate possible solution for their imaging need. So how do you plan to develop the whole thing yourself? Are you looking for what kind of partnerships are we going to develop in Berium for the different so, yeah, we, products? We look for, for, for example, the, so are you asking, uh, sorry, are you Both asking of you. me or First, I, I want you two to work together. So I'm going to answer my own question. Mm -hmm. Emberion, if you're looking for a strategic partnership to bring the cameras to different market segments, and Alessandro is a great driver and also a great partner of this. And Alessandro, thank you very much for joining the meeting today. We need to move on because I really want to finish on time. We have two more questions. The first one is coming from EVG. Martin, what's on your mind? Just a very quick question. Uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, I was wondering for the uh, for the graphene. Uh, how do you transfer it on the CMOS? To my knowledge, this is still a big challenge on larger areas. So I was wondering if you can comment on this a bit. I would be happy to have a more private discussion on that with our technology experts also in, in the meeting. It's uh, something that we do know how to do it in-house, but it's not something that I'm in a position to disclose and also I'm not an expert on that matter. 
the, 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 the yeah. seamless compatibility yeah. process of Emberion is really their golden fruit. This is what makes this company special. I really want to highlight this. This is really what makes this company special. So EVG, we have a discussion of lying about this, but if you can, we have to deploy this because this is fully seamless compatible. It's, it's really, truly amazing. Foco, thank you for being one of the jewels okay. of Epic. Thank you very much. And thank we're going to continue with the program. I'm really enjoying this meeting. And it's not only because of the presentation of Theon sensors, but also because all the room for cooperation. When we organized this meeting, we couldn't have this meeting without the presence of Ametech. In every single market report that we check, Ametech was highlighted in one of the key companies in the supply chain of CMOS sensors. So let's go to Peter, Peter Ruchmuller. Peter, let's try to find cooperations with Ametech. And the floor and the attention of everyone goes to you. All right, thank you. And I'll just uh, switch on my screen. So, uh, share those right. Still not here, but I guess you know the drill. Yes, you do. Yes. Okay. Uh, and. Yeah, Photonics Plus, 17, 18 February. I hope to see you all there. I really can't wait myself. Let's uh, open so PowerPoint. This? It's, it's opening. I think um, you have two screens and you're sharing with us the one that you yeah. don't want us to see. Yes, the floor is yours. Very good. Well, thanks for, for inviting me. Um, as you mentioned, Amatec is a big company and I thought it's worthwhile since you already have a couple of Amatec uh, uh, business units uh, being a member, but more on the packaging size to uh, give you a short introduction on what, what Amatec is. Uh, so we have founded more than 80 years ago, mainly on motors in the US. So produced uh, most of the motors and all vacuum machines. But recently, over the course of the last 30 years, really became a photonics company. Uh, and if you look at our brands that we are uh, representing, you find all kinds of things from uh, super fast cameras uh, with uh, vision research to uh, electron beam spectroscopy, uh, with EDUX, uh, spectroscopy, uh, uh, 3D measurement with, with uh, Korea form, uh, spectroscopy with, with, with Spectro and Saigo certainly is a name uh, in the, in the uh, market. And then uh, Forza being one of the CMOS design, designers herself. Ourselves, at, uh, on top of that, we have a couple of uh, companies that actually support the supporting industry, which are uh, the lens manufacturers by uh, supplying uh, diamond turning machines for lens manufacturing and measure those uh, with the likes of, of Taylor Hobson to uh, and also a lot help aligning uh, lenses onto CMOSs and make it into overall systems. So land itself is only a small part of it uh, and we are more or less the end user of uh, the photonics and try to make them work in the field. Uh, so in very much in industrial uh, environments. And since this is a CMOS meeting, so I'm, I'm trying to focus only on the CMOS side of things. And that's really in thermal imaging, uh, similar to what uh, Dimitros said earlier, except that we are uh, very seldom looking at people. Uh, we're more looking into the process where the temperatures are uh, quite a bit higher. Um, and one of those applications is really uh, measuring temperature wherever we look into. Uh, so that goes from glass manufacturing all the way uh, to uh, polysilicon uh, manufacturing as well. And uh, so we use fairly reasonable uh, resolution cameras. I mean, we heard about uh, even higher resolution, but a three megapixel in the, in the IR side of things is, is quite significant. Um, and what we are making with our cameras, we relate every pixel back to a temperature or at least the radiation that comes, that is equivalent to, to the temperature that comes from a place uh, that we're looking at. And so we do can do a lot of uh, software processing afterwards in order to make sure that uh, you can accurately determine temperatures with that. So where are the challenges in this? Uh, the challenges normally is uh, something that you uh, Jose, have said before is uh, dynamic range uh, and uh, resolution. 
And dynamic range, especially at the high temperature side of things, is, is critical for us because uh, it's fantastic to have a camera that can measure super accurate, uh, but it doesn't really work if it only works from 1,000 to 1,100 degrees. Uh, because you hardly ever have a process that actually is, is that tightly controlled. So, in order to, so what we can do for for uh, Epic is basically as land we we can measure temperature. You give us a temperature challenge, we'll we'll, we'll help you with that. What are we looking for? Well, I, what I find in in the world, and we had this uh, today as well. I think throughout the meeting, we we find three almost parallel universes. One is dynamic range, one is color, and one is high definition. And if you're trying to find something that does all three, uh, you are uh, very much very fast uh, being lost. There are some things that overlap, but it's not very often. So in the dynamic range, what I'm talking about is that you have a uh, a sensor that allows you to measure from 600 degrees to 2000, maybe 3000 degrees. And there are uh, CMOS sensors out there. Uh, they, they have a dynamic range of 120 dB. Um, and they are uh, either black and white or uh, RGB uh, sensors. What I'm talking about here is I'd like to have a logarithmic response. I'm, I, uh, it doesn't help me a lot if I have different size pixels. And it doesn't help me a lot, uh, a lot if the whole thing is time-based because I, I want to have uh, a continuous time for the measurement. Uh, similar things with IR. Um, so in order to, to measure different colors, there are uh, sensors out there that can, uh, I mean, we saw, saw one uh, EVG so showed that earlier that can do a thousand different colors. Uh, but those are single points. Uh, then there are uh, systems, silicon systems out there that can do 32 different colors. And there are sensors out there that can do eight colors of red or eight colors of red and a, and a gray outlook, output, but they are not with a high dynamic range. So it would be good to, to have the two overlap. And the second bit of that is it would be good if they didn't have any crosstalk so that you don't have to do uh, special compensations in the software in order to, to get onto, this, uh, onto the crosstalk. And then the last but not least, uh, in terms of high definition, I think uh, our way of looking at high definition is probably still a little bit uh, behind uh, the uh, 8K cameras or the 8K TVs. Uh, we would like to have at least for each of the four to, de to be determined uh, infrared wavelengths, uh, a VGA resolution on it. And since we're not living in a, uh, in a, in a uh, R&D world, but we are in an industrial world, so we, also, we still have to make product from it and, and sell it. So there's the little thing of money. Uh, so for, for now, and because we're based on high temperature, temperature measurement mainly, uh, silicon would be all right. So to pick uh, a few IR wavelengths still within the range of uh, silicon, 1.1 1, 1 micrometer uh, it would be the thing that we're looking for. That was the shortest possible way of, of doing five minutes. Uh, any information, any further information, please contact Thank me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. You made shortly, but it's very heavy, the last uh, slide, I would say. You put on the table very fine and interesting challenge, challenges. And I think that, uh, first of all, we have uh, uh, Jerome from Caleste that probably can uh, tell something and start the discussion. Please, uh, Jerome. Yep. Well, indeed, it's it, it, uh, an interesting challenge that you showed here. So I we definitely recognize a number of the of the requirements, the high dynamic range, and then indeed, uh, do you need uh, some kind of a logarithmic design, or is it maybe we can I can be solved with different gain ranges? Um, so I am not gonna 
talk about that, but it's certainly something to look into. And then I think combining it with the different wavelengths. So I, it's actually quite an interesting uh, request that you have on the table. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that we can help you out. Um, but yeah, we'll have to dive into a bit more of the details, I guess. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, to that. So let's, let's uh, stay in touch. Okay, so we will introduce you. We already established the content, and so it's worth that you continue the discussion. Yeah. And uh, yes, who else uh, could uh, give some comments or uh, make suggestions you know, on how to solve this challenging uh, point? Uh, I see that uh, also ST Microelectronics could add uh, some comments. This is not a comment, this is more a question. Can, can you comment on the four different wavelengths that you are looking at? Uh... Well, what I, where, where I'm a little bit flexible there, uh, but where, why I want to step away from the normal RGB is because they are overlapping, so they're not discrete. Uh, and uh, in order to measure anything in, in the green band, unless it's a truly logarithmic and super sensitive sensor, then I have hardly any signal uh, below a thousand degrees C. So that would limit my temperature range uh, because uh, you, you, we are, we're not illuminating, we're taking the energy from the heat. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it, it's probably something between, let's say 700 nanometer to 1.5, uh, 1.1, 750 nanometers to uh, 1,100 where, where silicon then stops basically, and then just pick four of those. Yeah, so in, in, in that case, uh, let's say if you are, let's say, looking both for uh, high resolution and, uh, and uh, uh, excellent sensitivity in the near infrared, uh, you, you will get in, in trouble because uh, you, you need uh, very small pixels. Uh, and getting good sensitivity uh, around 940 or 1 micron is quite difficult. Well, it, it is, and it, uh, I mean, the, the issue is not, uh, is not similar to what uh, uh, Theon sensor said earlier, because normally uh, the things that we're looking for or at are fairly hot. So uh, there's enough energy uh, coming from the target. So we're not trying to uh, to see something at night. Uh, so, okay. Okay. Um, and the, the, the temp tapering off the, uh, the silicon at, at, at above one micrometer is not really an issue for us. Okay. Uh, but I appreciate there is a different level between the one micron and the, and the 700 that potentially should be possible to adjust within the response of the uh, of the amplifier, for instance. Okay, so maybe we can discuss uh, after the conference. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. And then uh, Renato probably can comment uh, something because I know that they're working on IR sensor and wavelengths. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we also can do sense. Well, we're developing a technology for IR that could be of interest for you and also. We have experience uh, I showed before on uh, high dynamic range sensors and high resolution. So maybe we should talk uh, offline. Yes. Sounds good. Very good. Ding, ding, ding. The question in YouTube. We have a question in YouTube okay, all the way to Emberion from Villenhoven from, uh, from Anterion, also from Jan Vermeer and a little bit also from Caleste. The question is how does the spectral sensitivity of the VIR and s sensors compared to the Indian gallium arsenide sensors? Thank you for the question. I would say that the answer is easy. We have broader spectral response range that our sensitivity starts already from 400 nanometers and then it extends clearly beyond 1700 nanometers up to 2000 nanometers. So especially this area from 1700 to 2000 is something very special that we can offer. Thank you very much. And also would like to give my thank to Peter from Ametech. That was epic. That was spectacular. Many people are asking that they want to be introduced to you. 
you're going to be in for a lot of discussions. Thank you very much. We continue with the program. We go to one of the companies in Epic, R&D Center, who made a difference in a, in a cooperation with ST Microelectronics, who made a difference into the whole industry. We go to CEA Letty. And we go to Antoine Dupre, who is going to talk to us about the R&D efforts of one of the success stories of the CMOS research in Europe. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Grenoble, goes to France. Beautiful snow, I'm sure there. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, yes, I'm uh, located in Vernon, which is uh, the French Metro Valley, going to the number of partners working in the field of image sensor or imaging or lightning staging. So, what is the mission of, of Leti? Uh, the mission of Leti is to bridge the gap between academic research and the high level of TRL which are suitable for the industry. And to accomplish our mission, we uh, have an uh, electronic department of, um, comprising 200 uh, optronic researchers and covering a wide uh, spectrum of wavelengths, that is to say ranging from TRL to DNA. And beside this optronic department, we have also other people working on process and technology which are uh, supporting us, people working in emitting signal processing, and it turned rid of them, and finally, hardware implementation in the team. So not only we have um, a lot of people, but we have also large cleaning facilities to implement the technology. And finally, we have a quite vivid uh, research uh, mindset leading us to uh, deposit of, uh, to have uh, more than 3,000 patents and uh, to uh, submit and have published uh, 700 uh, papers yearly. So, regarding the changes for Imitsuto, I guess all of us are share the same one. Hey, Antoine, say. I have a problem here. A really small problem, but with an easy solution. The sound is not good enough. It's not epic and needs to be epic. So what we're going to do now offline, my team is going to contact you and we're going to solve the sound issue. And in the meantime, Ooh. we're going to go to the next speaker because I really, this is very important for me. People need to hear you loud and clear because there is, this is one of the presentations. I really think there's a huge room for cooperation. So let's, let's do this. Let's go to the next speaker and my team will help you offline to improve your sound. So in the meantime, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Switzerland because they have great chocolate and great snow today now, I'm sure. But also Frederic Sanella is one of the people at CSCN who is making a huge impact on the industrialization of optoelectronic devices. And today he really wanted to talk about their activities on CMOS. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Switzerland. Send me some chocolate, please. Goes to you, Frederic. Thank you very much for that opportunity to be here today with you. And good afternoon, everybody. So yes, so um, we are, represent a Swiss private research and technological organization located in Switzerland. And uh, here for that talk about CMOS imagers, uh, I'd like at this EPIC meeting to, to describe you what we can offer at CSCM in terms of micro lenses. So here is the pointer. The screen, uh, the screen sharing works well. Gorilla glass clear. Good, thank you. So first, why microlenses for imagers? So this is well known from the past discussion we had during this meeting. So uh, we can divide imagers into families, the front illuminated ones, which are uh, depicted here in cross section A and B, and where the light has to go in between the circuitry before going into the light sensitive area. And of course, putting a micro lens can uh, allow the light, more light to be collected. So the purpose is clearly to maximize the light collection efficiency. If you flip the structure over, you get what we get, uh, the, the so-called back illuminated image sensors. And here also micro lens can help by uh, uh, redirecting light in the pixel of interest and to perhaps decrease core stalk. Uh, and, and increase a bit of MTF and uh, improve the parasitic light sensitivity. So what we can offer at CSCM is prototyping and small series production of URI replicated microlenses on imagers. So 
what you see on these pictures is a cross section of uh, an imager. I think this one is a SPAD imager, and it's a front illuminated one. So you can see in the SCM pictures the, the interconnects, which are shining very bright. In red, it sketched the, the photosensitive area. And so the purpose is that the lens uh, uh, is focused by the lens here to, to collect more photons. And once the process is done, it goes back to the to the customer for packaging, as you see here with wire bonding. What makes us uh, on this field a bit unique is to be able not only to process wafers, so uh, we're up to six inch, but bare dyes and also package dyes. So you may ask, why is that so? Because for production, wafer makes more sense. But for many companies, they have often access to multi-project wafers. So they don't have the whole wafer to them and they don't have access to the wafer, but only to the dyes. And so we can process down to two by two square millimeters. So you can, uh, in terms of handling, you can uh, imagine it's quite challenging. It's like a, a grain of sand. And we, I will come back to the package dyes also later. That was a, a challenge that we had to, to tackle. Uh, the microlens deposition process uh, use material which are in a kind of viscous liquid uh, shape. So it allows to have a very conformal, uh, the, the whole structure is filled with this liquid material before it's uh, reticulated, cured. And we can use uh, various uh, class of materials. So we mostly use so-called organic, inorganic hybrid materials. You can also use standard organic ones, like polymers. Um, what also uh, we can do is to start from a few micron of uh, lens sag and diameter and go up to millimeter scale. Um, what are the applications so for today? Of course, it's uh, on imagers, so it can be SPAD, CCD, CMOS, also single photodiodes. But if you reverse the thing so that this part is now emitting light, so we can also beam shape uh, collimate light coming from Vixel and micro LEDs. So for Vixel, for example, we had the first product in uh, back in the year 2000 when the first Logitech optical mouse was uh, developed. And um, also we, we have another application running now for super resolution imaging, so it's for microscopy. So this time, the, the red part here would not be an LED, won't be a sensor, but a sample to image. And I have to add also that in terms of spectral range, so those materials, they, they work well from the visible range and also uh, near infrared, like let's say up to 2 micron, 2.2, something like that. Um, how do we do the process? So we have here a small sketch with nine steps and they are, uh, we can sort them in three main steps. So the first three steps are what we call reflow and origination. So we start with a standard photolithography step. We get pillars, we melt them, and we get the lens shape. This we what we call the master. So it's done on glass with a photoresist. We take this master and we take another glass sub, some sample with chromium on it, like a photo mask. We use this uh, liquid uh, optical material here and we try to take the negative of this uh, master here. So this is what we obtain here through UV casting, and it's what we call the mold, and this is our main tool. Once we have the tool, we go really on the application, so we use the wafer or the dye, here sketch in orange, and we dispense the microlens material here shown in kind of green, and we redo the same steps as just above, but this time directly on the wafer or dye to finally replicate the, the shape of the lens onto the wafer or the dye. And so then the mold can be reused several times to, to do kind of small series production. Where do we stand in terms of dimensions? So this graph is in log-log scale and how to read it. So the first red line is really to show you a perfect sphere, complete sphere. The blue line just next to it is the limit to, uh, of the hemisphere. And we are basically in this blue zone. So this blue zone is what we can cover. So from few microns to millimeters. And um, we cannot cover everything as you, as you can see. So if we go to, towards this direction, these are very, very flat lenses. And uh, that technique that we use here has the uh, limitation to, to not go towards so too flat lenses. 
On this range in the upper right corner, this is a domain of order origin origination technique like diamond milling and so on for millimetric lenses. So it's a bit the limit of what we can do here. And on the other side here, really at the bottom of the plot, it would be really the CMOS domain also for very, for, for, for pixels in the micron range or below where also there is an industry, a complete industry on that. So we are slightly, we are more in the range for pixels, which goes from several microns. We have also to consider the, the alignment between the, the toolings and the, uh, the, the die to, to be really efficient. And so tens of microns up to hundreds of microns and so on. I've also shown here a small red area, the domain here, which extend a bit this blue zone when we consider only these first three steps. So we can originate lenses which are beyond hemisphere in photoresist. And so then it means you, you have to stop here and you cannot continue the process. But uh, this is uh, what we call sub-hemispherical lenses. And this is for the application of super resolution imaging. Um, uh, I'd like to con almost conclude with some challenges. So we had a project running with Scaleste and ESA where we had to study the impact of micro lenses on a very advanced uh, uh, back illuminated image sensor. And there the first challenge we had to tackle was that uh, the imager we had to process was already qualified. So it means it was already packaged. They had to test that it was working and so on. So it was the first time that we had to handle packaged imagers. So we were taught it's impossible, but we say we had no choice. We have to, to manage and handle that. So uh, as you can see here, this means going in between wire bonds, not touching them, doing the process I've shown you in the previous slide, and also uh, handle the 3D package. So you have also the below the die, you have the package, and below the package, you have the pins, uh, really the electronic pins. So to try to handle this 3D object and process and uh, make the process flow I just shown before. So we succeeded. And uh, also something new for us was to handle be a back illuminated CMOS sensor because it means we cannot uh, by eye align the lens to the pixel. We can only use the alignment fiducials, of course. And we had to use uh, an advanced microscope at ESA just to assess after the process was done, what was the final result in terms of alignment between the lens and the pixel. Um, and at the end, so to answer the question, what can they bring for back unit image sensor? So we're expecting something really modest in the case uh, because the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the image sensor was already very good. So there you see a comparison how um, pixels covered with a flat microlens material and pixel covered with the microlens behave. And you see the improvement of a quantum efficiency and so on. So the most uh, dramatic increase improvement was on the parasitic like sensitivity as expected. Um, the last challenge we had to do was on the material because uh, for many applications, you have standards. So we heard today about military standards, space standards, automotive standards. And uh, for that meaning, the, the, should, uh, the, the product should undergo a qualification. And we had the occasion through that project to, to try to, to, to pass to some space environment qualification. And for this lens material, basically most of the tests were passed successfully, which was uh, good news for us. The, the thing that we identified as a bottleneck is the UV stability. So since the process works with UV and after we need to ensure that the material can still be transparent, not absorbent in the UV. So that's the main bottleneck we see for this, for the particular example of space applications. And so this is something that uh, we are looking forward to try new materials. So it's a message for material providers also uh, that we can make perform the process we have seen before, being able to be stable in UV and eventually also trying to push for UV imaging. On the other side, also that process, uh, other other challenges are ongoing now, such as trying to have a reversible pro pro process. So if you use a, a, a completely ready CMOS die, so the the, the final uh, 
the, the, where the cost comes from actually to try not to to damage it during the process so this we are good however if we are out of specification what we're trying to develop now is try to remove the lenses and do the process again so that the dye is preserved and the dye is usable at the end with that said um, I'd like to say also that okay, we we at CSCM we are not a production company, so we do mostly prototypings for SMEs and startups, academics. We also do small series, and we have through a European project called Fabulous that CSCM led. It's um, a pilot line under a building to upscale production. And you see here uh, the details with all the different steps. So it's was targeted to be wafer scale, roll to plate, and roll to roll production. And this is not only about micro lenses here, it's more general, it's about free freeform micro optics. So the, the, my message to you is here. Yeah, so we are really looking forward to all the challenging, new challenges to push our technology forward. Thank you very Thank much, you. Frederick. Uh, Thank you very much for this uh, presentation, very clear. And the challenges are already catched. We have uh, two questions from the participant. The first one is from uh, Caleste. So I will ask uh, Caleste to speak to Jeroen. And then we have also ST Microelectronic, uh, Eric, with another question. So challenges are on the table and now somebody yeah. is already catching you. Yeah, so nice, nice presentation. Um, and indeed, I, uh, we know, as you also mentioned in, in, uh, as one of the examples, when it comes to customized uh, design of micro lens, uh, uh, definitely the place to be. Um, but I was wondering just in general, because the foundries also have a standard micro lens offering, is that something that, yeah, that you also come, uh, have a benefit over? Is there still a reason to come to you in such case? Or if it's, possible with the standard lens, then essentially it's easier to stick with the foundry. I would say it depend on the on the imager itself. So if, as I said, the pixel pitch is much too small and the, uh, that we cannot do them, so for sure, then we will recommend continuing the foundry. Uh, I would say that uh, we can, in general, have higher sags. So the aspect ratio of the lens can be higher we can also tune the material. So the, the, the method of fabrication is different. Um, I think it's you use more like grayscale photolithography in the foundries. Uh, so it, the, if the, uh, the material which is used, which is a standard photoresist, for example, is not uh, pass, uh, going, uh, passing the qualification of your application, like space or so on, here we can play. And also for, uh, as said, for big pixels. Here we can indeed make uh, not only cover well the, the pixel itself, but also with a big lenses aspect ratio for um, uh, from, from handling uh, higher numerical aperture. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Eric, please. Yes, uh, I have a question. Are you limited to uh, hemispherical uh, lenses or uh, let's say circular lenses? Or can you realize also uh, different shape uh, like uh, freeform optics or worlds? So if we look from the top to so read the pixel view, so we can, vary, we can vary the shape. So a square footprint, hexagonal footprint, circular. Mm -hmm. If we look on the cross section, with the process I've shown, it's limited to circular cross section. However, so for aspheric or free form, uh, we will take over using the master done by partners. So the, the shape itself will be done by partners, for example, through Fabulous. And then we take over this to make the final tool and replicate the lenses on the chips. Okay, okay clear, thanks. Okay. So I will say that uh, we will uh, restart with Antoine. So I hope that the technical problem has been solved. So Antoine, you have the floor. So I hope it's better now. Do you now it's better. Loud Great. and clear. Excellent, excellent. Bravo. Go. So I want to start over. So as you know, uh, well, the challenges for image sensor uh, have been widely presented by previous speakers. 
And they are all the same, image quality, uh, data transfer, power, and energy efficiency, cost, of course, which can be uh, balanced by the added value that you can put in the image sensors. So uh, we, actually, we have to develop all novel original solutions to tackle those challenges. And I will take three examples uh, that have been developed at CA lately. lately. Uh, to start with, um, let's consider the wake-up imager. The wake-up imager is performing the detection of face or whatever the object it could be, but in this special, in, in this particular case, it's the, the face of a human being. And uh, the challenge is to reduce the power consumption aided by the processing that is embedded within the image sensor. And to do so, first we perform a coarse motion detection. What do we mean by coarse? It means that we use uh, very few data and the data representation is limited to a very little number of bits per data. Then when there is a, a probability to detect something, we, uh, we have implemented the second step to refine the, the detection of the motion. And then we analyze the image uh, by extracting some features which are used by a support vector machine to eventually recognize the face of a human being. That's something you can see in this video. The detection of motion, nothing detected. And then we have a face, then it turns green, it is detected. So what are the important things here is definitely the ultra low power consumption, which allows to have an always on image sensor. Then it is mandatory to allow the functioning of this image sensor within a wide range of lightning. And to do so, of course, we have embedded an adjustment of the exposure time at different phases of the process of the detection and the recognition. And finally, does it work? Yes, we have 95% detection rate, which is quite high to my own appraisal, but uh, since it has been transferred to ST, I will leave uh, the word to Eric Mazalera to comment. The other uh, challenge is uh, image quality and regarding uh, color X-ray imaging, there are many, many issues. First, you don't want to have a high dose, and it means that you are not going to lose the information coming from the photons. And second, uh, you have to, um, to shape the form of the, uh, of the signal you get at the detector level, at the transducer level, so as to uh, extract the energy. And if you use a brute force approach, then you have to have a very high speed A to D converter. And uh, even though you use this uh, 200 mega per sample A to D converter, you will lose many photons, one out uh, of 10. So we have introduced this 8 seat queue, which transforms the asynchronous incoming process of the photons into a sequential, purely, second, uh, purely a synchronous process. And implementing this Q6 allow to reduce the sampling rate and the power consumption and the requirements on the A2D converters. But not only that, it all allow also to reduce the mid photons by a factor of 10. So just by introducing novel features, thinking out of the box is very interesting to improve the image quality. It can be applied for X-rays, but also to other uh, part of the spectrum. 
Now, let's see how we can uh, also play with the cost and uh, potentially add values to your design. Let's consider the, uh, this, the system, which is photoacoustic imagery. The idea behind that is uh, to uh, use uh, acoustic waves to have, uh, which can be focused on a particular place, a particular location of the body, which is not the case, of course, of photons, which are going to diffuse through the body. And using uh, a laser, you have, of course, a coherent light, which uh, wavelength will be shifted by the ultrasons, by the acoustic waves. And retrieving this, uh, this uh, frequency shift within the pixels allow you to find out what is the amplitude at the particular, at the precise location, which is perfectly focused by the ultrasounds. So what we have to implement is uh, a coherent demodulation within the pixels. And what is a novelty here is that not only we, are, we perform the demodulation, but we perform at the same time the A2D conversion. And as a matter of fact, the sigma delta demodulators perform the demodulation and the A2D conversion. So what's the benefit of that? It allows to simplify the design of this system, the whole system, which is uh, used uh, nowadays by removing those two steps with uh, the acousto-optic modulators. So you can save money doing that. And now you can add uh, another functionality. Since you have the amplitude and the phase of the wavefront which arrive on your image sensor, by adding a liquid crystal on top of your image sensor on controlling the phase of this liquid crystal, then you can reflect uh, the light on the very specific point, which was the focal point of uh, the ultrasounds. So doing that, you can, for instance, activate uh, med uh, medicine or things like that um, by the photons, by focusing the energy of the photons. So, why speaking to, why going uh, with us? As you can see, we have many, many technologies which are available, some are not, sorry for that, but we have exclusive partnership in some fields. But if you have challenges, let's talk to us. And I think we can do something great all together. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for being all the way from Grenoble. There is a lot of room for cooperation here in every particular challenge. But for me, one thing that you said during the presentation is we are working with ST, transferring this technology to the industrial world. And this is the reason why we brought you here, because I'm amazed, amazed of all the work you have done with ST. I want to go to Eric. This has been an interesting meeting. We talk about optics. We also talk about the sensor part. We talk about different users. When we had the presentation of your partner, CEA Letty, I would like to come to you, see what's on your mind, and maybe get some final remarks. Well, thanks, Jose, and thanks, uh, Antoine. Uh, so yes, it's true that we have a long uh, cooperation with uh, CEA, and uh, we are very pleased uh, with it. And uh, let's say it's since uh, many years that we work together. And some of the ideas we, we had together uh, have been, uh, let's say, transformed into products. Some uh, over failed, but uh, that's the way I think uh, research and development uh, should be done and uh, we are very happy with it uh, and we we are uh, also looking at uh, maybe other type of collaboration with uh, other uh, institute or one question Eric 
one thing that is being amazing, uh, the success story for me, the cooperation of ST and CEA has been the industrialization uh, of different wafer level processes and the automation for the wafer level testing. And that has been something that in silicon photonics, for example, is the success story of Europe, in my opinion. Uh, when it comes to CMOS sensors, is there any challenge when it comes to wafer level testing that you think, well, let's, let's pursue this with different partners? Yes, you, you, you have to know that. So that's true that we have developed uh, wafer stacking uh, with uh, CLAT. We are now in the process of thinking uh, to go from two wafers to three wafers uh, stacking. And in that case, you, you, are, you can imagine that uh, the test uh, is quite a complex story. So this is uh, something that we are uh, looking at uh, with uh, also some CAD vendors and we've also some test specialists, etc. Yes, that's another one. challenging. Uh... Eric, thank you so much for helping this meeting. You've been conductor today. Well, in my opinion, the star goes to you. But I would also have to say that this meeting in two hours, two hours and seven minutes, with Scott is so many room for cooperation. Ima Senik is looking for a partner in micro optics, illumination and packaging. IMS, they are looking for a partner in custom CMOS sensors. They want samples because they want to develop a cast, a case study, Theon sensors that was really, truly epic, Dimitris. They are looking for a partner for the near eye projection optics. And Berion says, we are looking for partners to help us with the packaging and assembly and with different camera optics up to two micrometers. Ametek was looking for a partner to help them with non-exponential dynamic range. And that was really, truly epic. And at the end, we have a strategic, a strategic partnership here with CSEM. They are looking for companies that need a space qualification of Simon sensors. And yes, me, me, I'm just looking for partnering with the 670 members of EPIC. It was two hours and seven minutes. The meeting starts now. Not when you have to actually succeed. We have to start with cooperation. So you want to get in touch with any of the participants today and do a successful follow-up, all you have to do is send me an email, jose.post.epic-asoc.com, and I will make sure I make the introduction. I love doing that. It has been a really, really crazy two hours with lots of room for cooperation. These people are looking for partners and I make a living out of this. Until the next time, I would like to say that I am speaking here on behalf of an amazing team, amazing team fully dedicated to this industry. We love our job. Epic is a great place to work. For, so you're looking for medical, for integrative photonics, for laser technologies, for optics, you have to talk to the EPIC staff. They know what they are saying. I'm just here a communicator. We are the really, really angels of this association. Until the next time, be EPIC, wash your hands, wear a mask, because I can't wait to start traveling again and see all of you. Take care of each other. Bye-bye.